Just getting ready and we'll be starting soon. Okay, good. There we are. Okay. Hello, you guys. Thanks for being patient. We had some, you know, technical stuff behind the scenes. Don't you love technology when it goes awry? And it just decided to mess with us this morning. So anyway, we're here with you now. Give us a shout out where you're from. I'd love to see you. Hey, Christian. Uh, Quebec. Awesome. And just keep shouting out where you guys are from. We want to hear from you. And we're really excited about having our guest back on, Bob Holmes. We're going to bring him on in just a minute. Let's get through a few pieces of business, first of all. Um, Mark Silver here in Carmel, California. And our show is brought to you by our friends at Bay Photo Lab. Listen, guys, get something printed uh, these are some of their specials. This is 10% uh, off on, uh, you can get a wall cluster here with these different configurations. And these exposers are really pretty cool. These are um, printed on that material there. You can see it's sort of folded back and it has a hanger so it comes out from the wall. That's actually what I'm using behind me you can see those so whatever you do you can always get 25 percent off in your first order and the thing to do is to make prints whether you hang them on the wall or you make a book out of them or you put them in cards or whatever you want to do make sure you're making prints and getting off of just everything being digital so uh hey hector good morning and inga and kevin and great to see you guys. So listen, without further ado, if you've been anywhere near AYP, you know who I'm going to introduce you to. Our good friend, Bob Holmes, multi-award winning photographer, National Geographic photographer, incredible teacher. Bob, it's so good to have you back with us. Thanks, Mark. And uh, as usual, we are way ahead of schedule. So it's, it's been uh, a wonderful warm up process this morning. But what we're going to dive into is some of your tips for travel photography in terms of lighting and composition, right? Um, yes, I guess. I mean, that's a big open field for us, but that's, that's the specialty. Well, yeah, travel photography is... Uh an odd definition because it's just photography. You know, yes, it is. We all travel, even if it's to the supermarket. Um, so it's really just photography. But it covers a whole wide gamut, landscapes, people, everything. One thing I would like to say before we get started is an yeah. endorsement for Bay, Bay Photo. I've been using them for exposure prints, which are probably the, the, the best deal around if you want to display really large prints. Because you don't have to frame them. They come yeah, with a sort of skeleton frame at the back. Yeah, and, I'll pull uh, that up there. You can see plastic, it right there. Plastic, a plastic substrate. It's not. They're not paper prints. They print on some plastic material. But yeah. the quality is amazing. Exceptionally good quality. So I'm a huge fan. Oh, of, that's um, great. Exposure prints. Yeah, this one behind me right here. So that's what it's printed on. And it's it's got a frame. You can actually take those and change them out if you wanted to. Yeah. But what's great is they just go right on the wall, right, Bob? And they just hang I'm, up there. Very I've simple just, to hang. I've just moved house and I just roll them up. They you know, take up no space at all. They yeah. have some really significantly big prints. Um, and anyway, they're, running a, they're running a special 30% off. Bingo. Let's talk about uh, photographs. That's, that's yeah. So you know, we're going to talk about, you said we're going to talk about light and composition. That's probably the most, the easiest and the most difficult pair of subjects imaginable. Light yes. is fairly easy to talk about. It's fundamental to all photography. And I want to go, you know, not in depth, but go over what I've talked about previously. Composition 
is incredibly difficult because we all see differently. Yeah. If we all saw the same way, we'd all be taking the same photographs. So I find composition is um, probably the hardest aspect to tackle. Uh, you, you learn to develop your own eye. So, and I'm finding it very difficult speaking to myself because I can see myself on the screen. <laughs> several seconds after what I've said. It's a, yes, it's uh, a little bit of an art, isn't it? Well, i with my mind. Um, <laughs> I'll try not to look at myself. <laughs> good idea. Why don't we dive in? In this way, you can look That's at the photographs. Idea. Yeah, let's let's dive into the photographs. John, I'm going to bring this this first one up here. So, what are we so looking the, at? It's gorgeous. And, and I'll try and combine so tips on both light and composition. Although this is mainly about light. Uh, you know, as I just said, we all see things differently. There, there are yeah, two particularly for landscape or for any kind of photography, there are two kinds of light or two times of day, I should say, that everyone considers the best. The, the one that is le less considered is so called blue hour that's before sunrise and after sunset. Yes, it's, it's the time when the sun has set or almost set, but there's there's still light in the sky. So all you're seeing is the blue light from the sky. And I personally love blue hour. It's one of my favorite times of day to shoot. Um, this was taken on my last trip. Uh, I was almost trapped here by COVID, uh, which would have been a disaster because the whole area closed down and I'd still be there because Argentina is in a particularly bad way at the moment. Um, anyway, I shot this last March towards the middle of March when COVID was really hitting the world but hadn't reached Argentina yet. <clears throat> but it was taken very early in the morning, just before well, the sun was just rising. You can see you can see on the peaks. Yeah. Can you see my cursor? I probably not. Actually yeah. we can, Oh Jared's got it up. I'll, I'll yeah. be your cursor for you. So He's when I see it. you talking about a specific area, I'll move my cursor. Oh uh, you're a good cursor, Jared. <laughs> um, you know, the light's just brushing the peaks, but it's not really up yet. And I, I love this kind of light. I like mystery in photographs, um, and that's a that's a personal decision. You know, it's always my intent to have people wanting to ask questions about the scene rather than laying it all out. Um, so I, I shoot in blue as often as I can. Uh, but the other kind of light is so-called golden hour. So you go to the next one, Jared. And this, it's the same place taken with a longer lens, but there's more light and it's, it's more, this is not really golden hour. It's more red hour because yeah. there's such a vivid sunrises in Patagonia. You know, Patagonia is at the far tip of South America. Um, it's as far south as you can go in the world almost, apart from Antarctica. And the sunrises are phenomenal. Or well, so are the sunsets, but most of the mountains are facing slightly east. So the sunrises are just incredible. And um, this golden hour is always a beautiful time of day. It's very fleeting. You know, sunrise, you get really nice light, maybe for half an hour if you're lucky, at sunrise and sunset. It doesn't last long. So you have to work fast. You have to decide what you're going to shoot, how you want to shoot it, and then just work like crazy and um, shoot as much as you can. But, you know, the more common light when I'm traveling is, you know, and I've, this is something I've talked about a lot. There's the classic Vermeer lighting. And the next photograph is in a bakery in Cuba. And it's this beautiful light coming through an open window on the right-hand side. Yeah. And um, it it gives a there's no direct sun coming in. There's just this beautiful all surrounding light, um, and it helps with the bakers wearing uh, white outfits. And the com I was careful with the composition. I wanted them 
from the compositional point of view, gesture is important. And the gesture of the guy on the right with his hand off the table, yeah. just putting a bunch of dough down. And the other guys all intent on their job. I didn't want anyone looking at the camera. And I, I just like the positioning of them. It just all came together perfectly. And even the rows of dough laid out on the tray in front um, added to that formal composition. Bob, well, I have a question for you. Did, was there any other light in the room? Did you have them turn it off or was just this is how they're working? It was, it was me. You know, I, I cast light wherever I go, Mark. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> and you should know that. <laughs> it's coming brilliantly through the window. You managed to pull that no, there's off. No, no other light. I was, so there's no overhead light or anything. That's yeah. There probably was, but it was overshadowed by the window light. Yeah. I don't think the prop, actually I don't see any sign of an overhead light at all. I think I you see some options in the metal the metal countertop. Um, but I work very very simply. I, I don't like carrying a lot of equipment with me. I always use available light. I've, I shouldn't say always. Very 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 occasionally, I use a little strobe, but not very often. Um, in fact. I can't think of the last time I used one. Uh, so I always work with available light because it's, it's, I'm lazy, I guess. I'm a very lazy photographer. I put a lot of time in, but I don't put a lot of effort into lighting things and setting, setting things up. I shoot what I see. Um, and this is exactly what I saw. And Cuba is, you know, there's so many opportunities in Cuba. In fact, I'm, I'm taking a workshop there in November, if anyone's interested, oh, uh, absolutely. As you'll see the next, I'm sure all these photographs I'm showing are from Cuba, places we'll be going. Before we forget about that, Bob, do you have a link that if people are interested, they can find out about that? We can stick it in the chat. I'm guessing it's on your website, the Luminara workshops. Yeah, Lu Lu uh, Lumaria workshops. Lumaria. Lumaria workshops. I will find that and put it in the chat. We'll put it in the chat so you guys can check it out afterwards. You know, I'm consciously looking at, you know, I, I started shooting in black and white again to sort of give me, give me myself a, a jolt in creativity. But I'm essentially a color photographer and I'm always looking for color and the way light's working on things. I love this. This is a market in Havana in Cuba. And I love the, light, the, the incredible colors and the light in the back. And as you'll see, the next shot goes homes in on that. Can we go to the next one, Jared? Apologies, uh, I was getting the link ready. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I, I love silhouettes. And yeah. it was great they had pineapples there because the pineapples gave this nice spiky yeah. silhouette. And I just waited for people to get into the right position. And I think the next shot is yeah that's i with people's profiles i like the profiles uh, because i felt it gave more personality to the shot and then finally i got another shot of a guy cleaning up and sweeping and i love the reflection on the wet ground but you see well, these are four photographs all taken within a very short time frame all with in the same 20 yards of each other uh, but it pays just to keep working the subject if you see something that you like don't just take one shot of it work it just keep working that scene until you've got what you're really after and again with this shot I like the, the colour is important obviously but I like the gesture of the guy sweeping his gesture is important yeah. I got several photographs of him but this I prefer because his legs are apart and it looks as though he's putting some effort into mopping up the uh, the water on the floor. Um, can we go to the next shot, Jared? I, I must have forgot what it is. Oh, great. Yeah, so we've looked at light coming from, with the bakers, this broad Vermeer type lighting. The other mm -hmm. kind of lighting, which is not so easy to find always is light that comes from within the frame. There's no outside light here. 
But the, the other thing about this is the way that your sensor responds to color temperatures. Um, and I love mixed colors. I love mixed light sources because they give so many different colors. We yeah. have a warm tungsten light on the right, a white light in the middle, and this green fluorescent light on the left. Uh, and I just love this feel. And I like the feel of mystery. Um, and the next few slides will illustrate this. I think the next one is the same. You're not quite sure what's happening. Um, I just I love this moody sort of mysterious night photography. Uh, and I love that if we keep going through these, Jared, fairly quickly, because they're all the same theme. And I, I like stories with different stories within the frame using a wide lens of the previous shot with the wide lens as a guy inside watching television um, in this shot here. Oh, yeah. You see him sitting there in his house and see down the street as well. And I, I love, love this juxtaposition of, of things in the frame with multiple things happening. And these were all taken over a couple of nights in Havana. But the colours... You know, the, the colours were just phenomenal. But you have to know, the important thing is to know how your camera is going to respond to this. It's not just a question of seeing something and grabbing a photograph. You've got to know that your camera will respond in this way. In this shot, it, these were illuminated by lights from mobile phones. So all these amazing people, it's just light from the phone that's lighting you up. And that, you know, I use the wide angle again, probably 20 mil, maybe even a bit wider. Mm. Um, so she wasn't really aware that I was taking a photograph, but I wasn't hiding the fact. And Cuba's great. Cuba's a wonderful place to take photographs of people. The people are so friendly. Um, and the, the composition was intentional because I wanted to tell a story as well. And it's, it's more than just a photograph that I like as a photograph. It illustrates the fact that people in Cuba now have cell phones and that they congregate in certain hotspots where they can get a Wi-Fi signal. Uh -huh. And we do it as well. You know, you go to these certain places in, in the few towns in Cuba that have these hotspots, and you'll sometimes see dozens of people all on their phones because it's the only way they can get access to the Internet. But again, the, all these photographs show more than just a a straight street scene, there's something going on in addition. This is a bar. And again, I spent time here shooting this because, again, I like the two different light sources, the tungsten light and the fluorescent inside. And the next shot is the, the same place, but different grouping of people. Yeah. So I'll hang out in the place and shoot different configurations. I don't just go and shoot and move on. If it's something that I know has got potential, then I'll work it. And then I think I went around the corner in the next shot and got the same thing. Oh, no, I didn't. These must, I must have taken that one out. But also shooting inside, uh, inside bars and cafes, the light, this guy in the middle, the, the couple, he's got a, a flashlight out reading the menu. is a jazz club. And I think the next shot is a very similar, it's the same place, but just a similar, mm -hmm. uh, just a different configuration of people. And I liked it when the woman on the right had lifted her head up. Uh, and there's sort of two pictures in one. But you can get away with, um, the important thing is not to, with a scene like this, you have to be really careful not to blow out your highlights. And by yes. highlights, obviously the light source is blown out on the left, but the faces are not. It's in, really important not to blow out those faces. You know, if you just took a straight meter reading, you just blow out all the, the faces completely that are lit because it would try to compensate for the dark. I, I, I love blacks. I love dark scenes. So... Bob, do you use, uh, you use your exposure compensation to, to keep it from blowing out? Is that... Yeah, I use control. Yeah. yeah, I just crank it down to minus three for this. Yeah. 
or even minus four. And I, I, I always check the uh, Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do that. You got to keep you know. looking at your Instagram. Oh. By the way, folks, make sure you do subscribe to Bob. See his Instagram handle there. That's a good segue into that. I, you might be talking about histogram. I don't know. Maybe you should check your Instagram, too, at the same time. I'm on with Mark. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Andrea. We miss you. Mark, Hello. Um, so I have a question, then. You're able to do the call with Christoph. Yeah, yeah, call yeah. Bye. A, okay. a guest appearance. But looking at your histogram, and then you're controlling with your thumb the exposure compensation, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the way well, you this, do it. This is exactly the kind of shot that I love, where there's a lot happening in the image, and it is—it's the same. It's the same jazz club, but it's almost two separate photographs. It is. I notice that a lot about your photos, Bob. You have frames within frames frequently. Well, it's a, yeah. I don't like photos that are too simplistic. Yeah. Uh, it, there's more interest when there's an additional layer. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure what the next shot is, Jared. Can you? Uh, we move on to a new area. So. Aha! Uh -huh, that farmer, I recognize him. Yeah. Now this, yeah, this, this is a place that we'll be going to in Cuba in November. Uh, a, an area. It's a town called Vinales. It's off the main tourist track, really. People do go there, but it's it's not. A common place to go. Vinales is a tobacco growing region and um, that's full of a lot of great characters and landscapes. It's one of my favorite parts of Cuba. And this guy was, he was straight from the grapes of wrath. He, he was like a, a depression yeah. era farmer. Mm -hmm. He looked the part um, and, you know, they live a very simple life. He had a, a very simple farm. I met him because I was staying, he had a, an Airbnb and I was staying at the Airbnb. No way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, was was that the Airbnb behind you there? That's pretty classic no. com competition. <laughs> no, that was the deluxe one. I couldn't afford that. I, I guess so. No, the, and, the, the, the thing about these photographs is the light. Yeah, the yes. first one was just normal light. This, I wanted a portrait of him, and it was midday, bright sun, so I put him with his back to the light and then exposed for his face and didn't worry too much about the background. Um, and with it, you can see on the, on the post by, on his right-hand side, it's burned out a little bit. Sometimes you can bring that in in Lightroom. Yeah. If you bring down the highlights. But it, it made it an, a usable portrait. Um, if we go to the next one, I took him inside. This was the Airbnb. I took him inside in this softer light. And it was okay, but I didn't, it's a little bit too flat. Uh, it wasn't the kind of Vermeer lighting that I normally like. It, it saved having any harsh highlights burned out. Yeah. But eventually, I, I went to his tobacco shed, these little tobacco leaves on the left, on the right, I mean, right okay. of the photograph. Yeah. And um, the light coming in was absolutely beautiful. And I just got him to stand in the shed, made sure I got catch lights in his eyes. That was important. Yeah. I needed to get a little bit of light in each eye. And that, to me, was the best portrait by far. Again, it's this dark tonality that I, I personally love. I, you know, I always strive to get that in my photographs, sometimes to my detriment, because very often clients don't like that. They want mm. things bright and airy. Uh, but for my personal work, and this was personal work, I love that dark tonality. And I think so I have a lot, question, if you don't yeah. mind. So this photo... And this photo are roughly taken around the same time. The same, like roughly. Within, I mean, obviously, you moved around quite a bit within two days of each other. Okay. okay. Maybe even the same day. I don't know. What is he wearing? Uh, he's he wearing looks, the same thing. Looks like he's got yeah. the same shirt. 
He probably wore the same thing every day anyway. That's what yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> probably taking yeah. the same day. I yeah. don't honestly don't remember. And that's a look at the metadata. And don't and, and look beyond when you're taking photographs of people, again, if you're taking them for yourself, look beyond the obvious. And you know, the next shot, I think, is one of my all-time favorites. I love that. And it is, you know, in a way it's a portrait of him, but it's a much more imaginative rendition. And again, light in the horse's eye is important and focus. The, the, the horse had to be crisp. Yeah. Um, and also the next shot as well is, again, a portrait of him, which to me is probably sums him up more than any of the others. Because it, you know, there's his whole attitude, sort of shoulders slumped, yeah. stormy sky, walking through the tobacco fields, uh, machete hanging down by his pants. It was just, just a very much a dust bowl, dust bowl type of image of uh, the, one of these poor Cuban farmers tending their fields. I love those clouds. That's just amazing. Yeah, yeah, bad weather is my favorite. I love, mm -hmm. I love stormy weather, or what we call bad weather. I call it good weather. It's uh, that makes the photograph clear. Blue skies are so boring. Yeah, I like. Well, it gives I you like a whole weather. another layer and depth that you wouldn't yeah, get if I really just. Like weather. Yeah. And I, yeah, you know, I don't know. I haven't said much about composition in any of these, but. I don't know there's really that much to say because uh, it always, I, I approach them very intuitively. I don't start thinking, oh, that's, that would make a nice composition. But, Even though uh, you have, you have leading lines with the, with the path and, and the lines of the, of the tobacco uh, and plants and all that. I, I hate yeah. rules. I don't use rules much for this is a classic yeah. rule of words horizon almost a third of the way down he, he's two thirds of the way across the the one point is his hat and head against the white part this white yes. triangle of in the sky that's that kind of detail is important very important that's very interesting yeah you have to be preoccupied with detail if if that had been dark it wouldn't have worked as well you have to see the hat so little things like that are absolutely critical. They're, um, you know, they're, they're very important elements in, in photography. Uh, look at the edges of the frame, continually be, be looking at the edge of the frame. How you organize those elements, of course, is up to you as an individual. We all have our individual style. But the, the general rule of thumb is that you want to make sure that the photograph you take is what you intended to take. Nothing should be accidental. Even if you're shooting intuitively. You know, I, I always preach that you should get yourself into a state where you can respond to an image without even thinking about it. You pick your camera up and shoot. The camera, in fact, even gets in the way sometimes. You see things and just want to capture it. Be nice. I'm sure they'll come a time and just capture things by looking at them. I guess Google Glass was the closest we've got to that. Um, yeah. But you, you want to get to a stage where you can just respond to things, but respond to them with a firm basis of knowledge and practice so that you're shooting with intent. Intention is absolutely critical. And your timing on this on this photograph, Bob, you not only did you time it so that you've got him against that white part of the cloud, but you've also got his right foot up in the air. So you're looking at all those things that are. Yeah, happening. those little details. It's gesture. Yeah. With, with his right foot. In. You know, the, the two things that I always teach people that you need, you need punctuation in a photograph and gesture. If there are people involved, 
then gesture is really important. It's like the baker with his hand on the dough off the countertop. That little gesture helps make the photograph and gives it some life. His foot off the ground in this shot is that little gesture that gives it a li little bit more vitality than, than just standing there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I, I think that's the last shot, isn't it, Jared? You've covered a lot of ground there, Bob. And uh, yeah, as I say, the, the compositional thing, I always, when I'm teaching workshop, I, I always link it back to uh, paintings and drawings and other art forms. Yes. And immersing, immersing yourself in other visual media so that uh, you, know, you, you learn to condition your vision. And it doesn't mean you're copying. You don't, you don't want to copy other mediums or, or other photographers. I look at a lot of books of photography. You know, I love work by Salgado. Salgado, I think, is one of the finest photographers working. Um, Alex Webb is one of my favorite photographers. Uh, his work is phenomenal. Very, very difficult. Very com complex work in color. But I respond to it very closely. It doesn't mean I go out and copy it. But it inspires me. And... Um, you know, it helps me see things differently. I have a question for you, Bob. And by the way, we have a few more minutes, you guys. If you have questions for Bob, please put them in the chat. Bob, I've asked you this before, but I think it bears repeating. So in terms of learning what your camera sees as opposed to what your eye sees, what, what, what do you recommend the process is for that? I... In the days of film, I used to take students out and we'd find a landmark, a building or something and photograph it throughout the day. Uh, we'd start early morning and just take photographs every couple of hours or every three hours during the day until it was night and we were taking these night shots with all the artificial lights on. And you use the same camera, the same roll of film, the same lens, and the same thing applies with digital cameras. We can go out with you know, the same camera and same lens and obviously the same memory card, leave the color temperature setting on. Normally, I, I always keep mine on cloudy most of the time. Yeah. And I guess one of the odd things now compared to film is that we can infinitely adjust the color temperature. That's right. In Microsoft or Photoshop. Uh, we couldn't do that with film. You're stuck with what you got. But it's still worth doing it with digital. And just going through this process of photographing the same thing throughout the day and seeing how your camera records it. It's exactly as I was doing with the night shots in Cuba. Mm -hmm. I knew how the camera was going to record those and how it was going to record the different light sources, the tungsten light, the fluorescent light. Um, so, you know, unless you practice and learn how your camera is going to record things, you're never really going to know. And your ultimate goal is to be in complete control of the medium. If you're going to photograph with intent, you should know what your camera is going to capture. It yes. shouldn't be a guess. You, you don't want to go in there without knowing what the end result is going to look like. And so, that's tr true no matter yeah, what camera, whether it's an iPhone or a, a Z6. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. That's, that's the way to get to Carnegie Hall. There you go. I'll let you guys know a couple of things that are coming up. We Bob has written an ebook that's going to be available very soon. We're just in the final stages of design on that. So stay tuned. And the other thing we're going to do, Bob, is we're going to create a webinar with you within, I would say, the next couple of weeks. You and I just have to sit down and schedule it. And that's going to be a kind of an, a concentration on a lot of the key points that you covered in our two-day class. But we're going to kind of distill those down. 
So you guys should definitely stay uh, alert for those because those will be coming your way very soon. And that's just a good way. That, that class that we created with you, Bob, is fantastic because you guys get to see Bob in action, not theoretical or Robert talking Bridges. about... It's a very beautiful site, actually. You now you get to see him really directing a model and why he does certain things and how he, you know, his mindset as far as what he's looking at. And uh, it's two days. So, uh, Jared, I, I think you're still with us. If not, uh, we'll get that link in there so you guys can check out his class. But uh, if there's any other questions, this is the time time to ask Bob. Bob, you've been, um, and I know it's in your ebook, but you've been focusing on photographing close by because we can't travel. Is there a difference for you in terms of how you approach your photography as opposed to going to Cuba or, or traveling, you know, to Patagonia? Do you find it's different or have you had to change your mindset a little bit? More shooting. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of yeah, the question. Well, I was reading, yes. I was reading some of the comments at the side. So, oh, in terms, yeah, in terms of you're focusing more on your shooting locally, has that been yeah. a change for you? Do have you had to adjust your mindset at all to that? Not really. Yes, as I often say, travel photography. You know, I, I live in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. So, yeah. you know, look how many people travel to San Francisco as a visitor. And for them, photographing San Francisco is travel photography. And it's no different for me. Yeah, you know, my office used to be 10 minutes from the Golden Gate Bridge. So I've shot the bridge numerous times in all kinds of lighting conditions. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate in being in such a, a picturesque place but a lot of my work now is in um, vineyards and for wineries. And one, one interesting thing that I started doing, which I never thought I'd ever do, is real estate photography. I've been photographing very expensive houses. Uh, and surprisingly, I really enjoy it. it it's, it's a challenge to create photographs uh, when you're photographing a house that's selling for $5 million or more. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Bob, something happened there. Thanks for getting back in there so quickly. Sorry, you guys. Uh, I don't know some, what some demon I, hit, the, hit the screen there, but we're back on. But you were talking about yeah. photographing these $5 million houses. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, I, I'm, a photogra I'm a photographer. Yeah. That's, that's what I do. And I don't really mind what it is I'm taking photographs of. Uh, it's, it, it's always an interesting challenge, whether it's a winery, vineyard, million dollar house, it doesn't matter what it is, I find the challenge interesting. It's, it's, it's solving a problem visually. Right. It's finding a visual solution to a problem for a client. And, uh, that I find very, when you're successful, that is very satisfying. Let's take up this question here. I'm going to put it on the screen from Shema. I'd like to know how you would recommend someone to educate his or her eyes for recognizing and seeing in terms of light because it's something uh, taken for granted. I mean, you well, covered, you, I, you covered I, that. Are you, are, is this coming through? Okay, I'm very jerky on my screen. Uh, I'm I, almost, I can, I've gone slightly digital. Yeah, I think you're all right. I can see you. We're, the, YouTube is giving me a, a message that they're buffering a little bit, so it might be a little bit more jerky. Yeah, as long as you can hear me. Um, yeah. I think the answer to that, Chima, is that you have to force yourself to constantly look at light until it becomes second nature. It's almost a curse because sometimes you see beautiful light and you don't have a subject to go with it. I've got several speeding tickets because I've seen amazing light and then had to drive like a maniac to find a subject. 
particularly landscape stuff. Um, and it, it's the same with people, looking at light on people. One of my kids has criticised me for staring at people. He <laughs> said, you know, you're always staring at people, Dad. And I tell you, it's what I do. That's It's my job. <laughs> it's your job uh, to look and see, right? Yeah, I have to look. But sometimes light is so absolutely perfect, but you you force yourself to look at light. Well, you, you look look at other photographers' work and see how they've used light and then look at, look for it in the real world and then try and replicate it with your camera. Not replicate it, try to capture it with your yeah. camera. But until you can see it, you don't know what to capture. So you have to train your eye to see the light. And this goes back to looking at paintings, looking at classical paintings particularly, you know, Rembrandt, any, any of the great painters, yeah, the great classical painters use light incredibly well. And it helps you to see light in a whole different way. Now that museums are opening back up again, that's the thing to do, right, is to go actually see the, wall, the work of art on the wall so you can really get the feel for how that artist captured whatever well, that scene is. You don't, have, you don't have to go to museums. There's so many virtual galleries now. Most yeah. museums have a virtual museum on, online. So you can still look at this stuff even from you know, your own home. And uh, you know, I recommend it. And there are lots of videos of work by the great photographers, by the great painters. You know, sometimes I go down the rabbit hole and I'll lose half a day watching videos. But it's, uh, but it's inspirational and it's filling it's, your... It's, 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 yeah. It's inspirational, yeah. Absolutely. Bob, before we sign off, are there any other uh, things that people ought to know that are coming up? You have that one workshop. Are there other um, uh, opportunities for joining you in some way? We'll, we'll definitely put your link to your Luminara so they can find you there. And yeah. follow him on, follow him on Instagram. Badgerag, or is it Badgerag or Badgerag? I don't know how to pronounce. Badgerag. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, our workshops are not, compared to other workshops, we're very competitive. I appreciate that they are expensive, inevitably, because we go to places where there's an inherent cost in being there. You know, we have to hire local transport, local guides, book hotels, meals. Um, so it's they're, they're not as expensive as comparable workshops. And there are at least two of us teaching. As a, My partner, Andrea Johnson, who some of you may know from these videos, and in, in most places we have an additional person in Cuba, Chris Baker will be joining us. Chris is a National Geographic photographer who's written the standard guidebooks to Cuba. Chris has been to Cuba, I think, over 250 times now. Um, and he's the he's National Geographic's Cuba expert. So that's included the cost. We have a ratio of one to three, which is uh, very, very rare for photo workshops. Um, usually they're, they're one to one to eight at best. Uh, anyway. Yeah. You asked if, uh, so I think the other part of that was tips for seeing your, your familiar, your area as a tourist would see it. Uh, which I think you described. It's a really interesting. That's a really interesting question because, you know, National Geographic's model was always to go to a place and don't pick your camera up until you've been there for a couple of weeks so that you get to really, you never get to really know it, but you you become much more familiar with it. My philosophy has always been to go to a place and start shooting the minute you arrive because then things are very fresh. Once you've been in a place for two weeks, you tend to take things for granted. They become part of the scenery. So there yeah. are two divergent philosophies uh, and I have to admit it's very difficult to go to a place that you know well 
and put yourself in the position of a tourist. I did a, a cover story for Travel Holiday magazine years ago. And the story was written by a travel journalist who had left San Francisco 20 years before. And it was a story about his reactions on coming back to live in San Francisco after a 20 year absence. I was given the assignment to go and photograph San Francisco with a fresh eye. And I'd already lived there for 20 years. And I really sweated it. Yeah, I, I didn't know how to approach it. In the end, I decided to shoot on a four by five camera. And I went around with my four by five and shot large format photographs. It made me slow down, see things a little bit differently. Um, and in the end, I, I didn't hear anything back from the art director for a couple of weeks. And my office manager at the time was fed up of me moping around because I thought I'd really screwed up the job and I'd made a total mess of it. And she said, call him. It was a, Bill Black was the picture editor at the time. He had call him and ask him how the photographs are. Uh, and I was scared, I was scared to because I, uh -huh. I didn't want to hear anything negative. Um, I called Bill and he said, oh, hi, Bob, I'm sorry I didn't get back to you. I've been really swamped trying to get the next issue out. Uh, but you did a great job and we've even got a really great cover photograph out of it. And the cover photograph was a shot of the Golden Gate Bridge taken in late afternoon light that's been shot a million times you go onto Google Images, you'll see the same photograph any number of times. But that was the shot they decided to use on the cover for San Francisco with fresh eyes, which was you know, ridiculous, really. Um, but it, it's difficult. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is you try and shoot things. If it's a place you know well, try and shoot it with either a different camera or if you use a camera, go out with your phone and shoot it. If you use your phone, use a camera, shoot it in black and white. If you're generally a color photographer, get out of your comfort zone. And you cover a lot of these points in the ebook that's coming up. So you guys stay tuned for that. Bob, thank you once again for joining us. We covered a lot of ground this morning. And uh, it's given everybody a lot of stuff that they need to go out and, and work on. Do the exercise that he said here. Photograph a scene every couple of hours throughout the day and see what happens as, you, as the light changes. Yeah, one thing I should mention about the workshops is that we're working on some local workshops. Yeah, oh, particularly, good. You know, particularly with COVID getting reasonably under control and hopefully will continue to. Um, there's uh, There's been a lot of demand for local workshops. Uh, unfortunately, local for me is Northern California, uh, but we may expand to other places around California and um, Oregon maybe. My partner Oregon, my partner Andrea lives in Oregon, so we may even do some on the Oregon coast and beautiful parts of Oregon. Anyway, if you if you look at our Lumaria workshop site, that they will be posted on that eventually as soon as we've... Um, we will uh, we'll make sure that's in the description as well so you guys can actually click on it and see what's going on with Bob's workshops. And then uh, definitely on your Instagram because you keep us up to date there. So make sure you guys are following Bob there as well. Well, Bob, okay. thank you. Thanks. Thank you uh, once again. We'll be in touch really soon. I super appreciate having you back with it. Thanks, everyone, for uh, watching. And thanks, Mark and Jared Flood, for uh, the smooth operation. Absolutely <laughs> smooth. Flawless. Once again. again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take care. So thank you guys for joining us. Listen, the important thing is not just what he said, but putting it into use. And I'm actually going to make from what Bob's been talking about and a couple of other things, I'm going to actually make a series of 
action steps for you guys to follow. So you can take a look at those. Those will be in the AYP Plus classroom. Uh, but remember, you got to go out and photograph no matter what. You got to photograph in your area because that's where you are. And look for those changes he was talking about. Look for the changes in light. Photograph in black and white if you're usually photographing in color just to, to help you find the newness. Ah, there's Jared back with us again. He, he had gone away. Okay, so listen, guys, um, a couple of items of news. So uh, next Thursday, I'm going to be actually doing a, a workshop at 12 noon Pacific. You guys can join us. We're going to cover some a couple of points as far as common misconceptions in photography. Jared will get that out to you. Um, Jared, you're back with us. Is there anything we we missed here? Uh, not sure. I, I just uh, got in here. I apologize. My meet my. Internet company is uh, they're working awful. In other words, I'd rather not say right now. So, okay. But, so I will be giving them another call. I think we're good. And, so listen, you guys, uh, have you stay tuned. Have you told them to subscribe? <laughs> I haven't told them to subscribe. So thank you for reminding me that. Uh, remember to subscribe and enable the bell. And you will not miss any of our shows that way. Please leave your comments. As always, we will respond to them. And if you have a specific question for Bob when you're watching this, you can leave your comments and we'll make sure Bob gets those. Uh, share these videos and like them. And last but not least, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Take care. We'll see you guys again really soon. Tune in to AYP Plus this Tuesday, okay? And you're going to you're going to love being with us. Take care of you guys.